I do some consulting work on the American feeling Indian in the room issues. Was you don't ever say to her that her point about the shock was... She's qualified for services. We left. More of a community. We're trying to back over. doing in autism. Paula Kerger is president and CEO of PBS. Her commitment to quality programming and the use of new technology has resulted in a broad range of initiatives and national acclaim. Prior to joining PBS, Kerger served for more than a decade at Educational Broadcasting Corporation, where her ultimate position was executive vice president and COO. She's been included on the Hollywood Reporter's Women and Entertainment Power 100 list for the past eight years and is the recipient of new numerous other honors and awards. We'll talk with her about the latest developments at PBS, the importance of the PBS mission in our communities, and about life after Downton Abbey. Here's our conversation with Paula Kerger. Paula Kerger, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Before we talk about PBS, I want to find out a little bit about you. Uh, you took the reins of PBS in 2006, becoming the sixth and the longest serving president of PBS since uh, it succeeded National Education Television in 1970. Tell us a little bit about the path, the career path that led you to, uh, to lead PBS. Uh, it's, you know, it, I talk to a lot of young people about career paths, and I think for me, it was not a deliberately plotted out adventure. Uh, I, but I, I often think that everything that I did in my life clearly was leading me to, to this place. Uh, beginning with the fact that my grandfather was uh, in Baltimore, uh, was part of, of a group that created the public radio station there. He was a professor and, and had this idea that, that a radio station could provide a real world experience for his students and so you know public media i think started in my in my in my formation and of course i remember watching public media as a child but i came into public media really as someone who's worked her entire career in the in the nonprofit world and i came into public broadcasting about 25 years ago uh, working in a station in new york i first was involved in um, in development and helping putting the resources together helping them set up an endowment and uh, from there became the station manager and uh, became more and more involved in the actual management of the station, the running of the station. WNET you refer to? At WNET, to. Channel 13, for anyone that lived in New York knows Channel 13. And uh, I was in that job actually when I got a call one day asking if I would consider putting my hat in the ring to be the CEO of PBS. And it was a period of great transition. I felt at the time that although I loved my job in New York and actually had no intention of leaving, I thought that it was going to be an important moment for public broadcasting and I thought it was important that the next leader of public broadcasting actually come from one of the stations. Um, the, my two predecessors didn't have that experience and they brought a lot to PBS but they also had some unique challenges and I thought at least I could uh, in my work working with stations be able to speak from a place where um, they all were, which is that I'd walked in their shoes and understood at, at a very fundamental level some of the challenges that they were facing and, and that I think actually has served me well. You talked about your grandfather and the role he played in the development of public radio. Actually, Pennsylvania played a significant role in the development of public broadcasting. Right. In fact, it's here, you know, at Penn State. Penn State was always, uh, if you look back in the history, has always been involved in, in really looking at media as a way of extending education and information beyond the community to, you know, some of its early days using broadcast as a way of extending and uh, actually the station itself was first called PSX and X stood for exchange, meaning how to extend the work of Penn State out to a broader community. But most people don't realize that actually at the Nittany Lion Hotel is where the then FCC commissioner announced that Spectrum was going to be set aside for educational purposes. It was really the first moment that it was discussed that there would be educational television, and that happened right here, and it happened right here 63 years ago, almost to the day that we're sitting here having this conversation. So I think that's pretty, I think that's pretty special. I, I like to think of this as being really the cradle of, of public broadcasting, and it happened right here on this campus.
I want to talk a little bit about how you make all of this happen because you've jokingly talked about your job as akin to herding cats. Mm -hmm. There are 354 independently owned and operated right. member stations. So, and and we're not talking about a, a restaurant franchise where they're all no. alike. They're all very, very different. They're so all profoundly different. I mean, this is in many ways the most American of institutions because we are very local. Every station is independent. It is owned by the people in the community in some cases, as is the case here, the station is, is part of Penn State and other parts of the country. My old station was a was part of the community. It had a community board. Some of our stations are part of the state. And so and each station grew up in a community, put on the air by people in that community with the express purpose of being able to share ideas and, and be educational media different than commercial media. And so all of those stations together created PBS. I remember when I was first hired to run PBS, people congratulated me and said, oh, you're going to run all these 350 stations. I said, no, no, you have that backwards. They're, they run me. <laughs> um, but um, but we, the stations came together uh, to create PBS with this whole idea that there would be an opportunity that you could create at scale if stations came together to collaborate, um, where you could create programs like the News Hour and Sesame Street and could empower filmmakers like Ken Burns that one individual station would be able to do on its own. So there is a social contract between our stations that we not only support to create this collective, but that we also agree that we'll do a lot of things the same. So in most parts of the country, you'll find Masterpiece on Sunday nights, you'll find Nova Nature on Wednesday nights and so forth. Uh, but each station makes its own decisions of what ends up on the air. Ultimately, every station makes that decision independently. And so my job is to help the stations together form a sense of collective vision and purpose. And so with agreement that we're gonna move more or less in the same direction, we can accomplish great things together, but with also the flexibility and power of being also very local and very bespoke. In fact, you talk about it as, uh, you know, if PBS is to thrive, it's its collective identity that right. will allow it to do that. Right. So I'm wondering just how disruptive is it when a station says, I'm going to move documentaries to off the main channel and on to uh, uh, another part of our service. Yeah, so we're navigating through that right that exact issue right now. I think that um, one of the things that is challenging is uh, to try to figure out ways that um, we make sure that stations have a, enough flexibility. And, then, and in this circumstance, the station that was interested in finding another home for documentaries, another time sc schedule, is that they also wanted to serve another of their audiences, which is the arts. We have a very deep commitment in public media to be a home for the arts. We want to give every American a front row seat to the greatest performances. And I don't mean that by um, just Broadway or just the big splashy performing arts programs. We do uh, programs here. We did a profile of the Pennsylvania Ballet that was aired nationally. We did a program on the movement of the barns to downtown Philadelphia. It's just two examples that are actually are a little closer to home here. And so figuring out how to accommodate all of that is, is, uh, is really a challenge. And so we spend a lot of time talking to filmmakers, talking to the stations, really trying to figure out, and I think we're now on the other side of really making a commitment that yes, we're all going to get together behind independent film. But it's not just about a single night of the week. It's also how do we look for ways that we're promoting independent film online? How do we look for ways that we're really showcasing independent film in all the other places where our content is located, whether it's Roku or Apple TV or others? And how do we look for ways that we can partner with independent film festivals and independent filmmakers at the local level as well as nationally to really make the impact of the programming that we do so much larger than just putting it up on the schedule and then hoping that people will find it? And so through a lot of dialogue, which believe me, no commercial organization organization would do. They'd make a move and people would be upset and they'd say, oh, this was a business decision and we go on. But we really listen and we really try to figure out how do you accommodate the difference between what we'd like to do collectively with what a local station might do to be able to really create a solution where everyone wins. This is a question I have to ask because uh, so many people 
uh, have been reintroduced to public broadcasting and have renewed their, their support for it because of something like Downton Abbey, which really has uh, put Masterpiece Theater uh, back on the map and back in the black. We've all heard that this uh, sixth season will be its final one. What has Downton Abbey meant to the system, mm -hmm. uh, to the service, and what do you envision as life after Downton Abbey? Yeah, it's a really great question too because I think that Downton Abbey, and most people when they talk to me about Downton Abbey believe, oh, this is such a great and important series because so many people love it. It's, it's obviously bringing in a great audience. I love the fact that it's actually bringing in a multi-generational audience. A lot of times when I talk to people about Downton Abbey, they say that you know they love the series, but what they also really love is the fact that it's a program that you can watch with your children and grandchildren and and it just it really does bring people together and it is it's one of those handful of programs I think that are on television now that are truly water cooler type of programs right people know that they can watch Downton Abbey many different ways they can get the DVDs or they can watch it later but a lot of people work really hard to be home on Sunday nights to watch Downton because they want to be able to talk about it it's very much a, a um, uh, a program that you want to be able to share and discuss. And so, um, and so, but for our system, for public media system, it has been so profoundly important because I think we have great programs that we can point to as part of our heritage, but those moments of programs, whether it's on public television or commercial television that truly pop, that everyone talks about, those are increasingly fleeting. And I think that for a lot of people, um, it was the belief that perhaps those days are behind us, that we would never have another program like an Upstairs Downstairs that would have Anne that of Green same, Gables and a Green Gables of that would ago. have that same sort of, you know, um, energy around it. And so Downton Abbey is a powerful reminder that yes, those moments do continue to happen and that we should continue to look for them. So, um, you know, so we have another season ahead, so I'm not yet um, talking about the end of Downton Abbey because we still have one more year. But what I, um, but we are thinking about and what we are, we've invested in is a lot of drama because there's really great drama actually on television, uh, commercial television, cable, and, and, not and on just public British television. Drama. And not just British drama. So we're producing a, a, um, a drama right now. We're shooting it outside of Richmond. Uh, it's called Mercy Street. It's about, uh, it's, a, it's a powerful Civil War series uh, that really talks about the birth of emergency medicine. It, it's based on a true story that happened in Alexandria. Alexandria was a city that was um, certainly below the Mason-Dixon line, but was controlled by the Union. And the hotel um, in Alexandria that was converted into a military hospital had both the Union and Confederate uh, nurses, and it is really a very powerful story uh, that's a very much an American story, you know, and so we're really excited to bring that forward. We have uh, we have uh, Indian Summer coming up, uh, which for those that love um, Love Jewel in the Crown is very much in that in that spirit. It takes place during the Raj. So we're looking, and we have Sherlock coming back. Um, and so in the same year that Downton joined public broadcasting, uh, an, a then unknown Benedict Cumberbatch uh, was also uh, sort of burst on the scene as a as a very new kind of Sherlock. And and we're shooting right now the newest of the Sherlocks. So we have a lot of good things in the pipeline with Downton Abbey in the short term and longer term expanding on that legacy. Uh, you mentioned Roku a moment ago and all of the various platforms that PBS content is now available. How concerned are you that while well, people consume this content that's now available exclusively on the web, not even made for television, that people will associate it with PBS and then support it? Well, brand is really important, and so one of the things that we've we focused on very specifically, because there's a glut of material everywhere, and, and so how do people find content and how do they make good content decisions, and one of the things that I think we have worked very carefully in conjunction with our stations is, is really um, focusing on the value of that brand, which I think stands for programming that is authentic. You know that it's going to be engaging and educational, hopefully inspiring when we really hit our mark. And so we've been pretty relentless in looking for ways on, on all of these different platforms, not to just create a space for PBS, but for uh, to create a space for WPSU as well and for our local stations. And so we've built everything 
off of the same sort of backbone where um, you know, we are not only bringing Ken Burns' work to these platforms, but also WPSU's uh, work as well. So if you have a, the app, or if you um, have an Apple TV, or if you have a Roku, you know that you have to, when you sign up, you have to localize it, and you pick your station. If you go online to pbs.org, the first thing that pops up is pick your station. And so the reason that you're doing that is that it's constantly connecting you back. I think that as, um, as stations and as a system, we have to be mindful of the fact that a lot of people will continue to go to television, but a lot of people are also looking for us in different places. And I think that we all learned a lesson from the record industry some years ago that um, if you force people to do what you want them to do, in the case of the record industry, buy albums versus buy songs, or in our case, if you force them to go to here on a, on a, on a broadcast channel rather than looking at various places, people will pass you by. And so I think we want to make sure that we are there in all those places, but that we're constantly pointing back to the channel as well. So that you have a WPSU experience on the tablet, but you also are reminded of the breadth of, of programming also on the channel as well. And I think if we're really conscious about that, um, it will be successful. And we saw it in the fall with the Roosevelt's, Ken Burns series. You said 33 and a half million Americans watched. watched. They also went online and streamed, and they went back and watched. So we see how people are flowing back and forth. So people aren't going one, one place versus another. They're in all places, and I think we just need to reinforce that. Some are binge watching. Some are watching while the rest of the country is watching. Right. Some <laughs> spread that experience out. It, so it's, it's really, it's a, it's a, people have very different viewing habits and also are balancing their schedules, and we just need to pay attention to what people want. One interesting uh, thing that PBS is doing is the PBS Digital Studios, and one of the first phenomenal hits, uh, although it's not what you're all about, was uh, an auto-tuned remix of Mr. Rogers' yeah. uh, The Garden uh, Gardens of Your, of your Mind. Of your yeah. mind yes. yeah. um, which uh, it was went, kind of, went viral. It went viral and it was, you know, it was an experiment. So we created this space, Digital Studios, as a way to begin working with people who were working in YouTube to try to um, look at how we could take their story, storytelling and really, you know, and these, and these are people that really have sort of PBS DNA, that's how I always like to think of it, how we could bring their storytelling under a PBS umbrella and really begin to experiment in, on those kind of platforms. And so the very first thing we did was the autotune uh, with Fred Rogers. and Which is marvelous. It was crazy. I mean, we put it up, it immediately went viral. If you got it in your head, it sort of stuck there. It's now in my head, so I'm not sure whether <laughs> I should be thanking you or cursing you. Um, and it just showed us that people, and people talked about it. They, they, you know, if you looked at the comments, they were really tapping into their own experience. Experiences. And how much it, they loved Fred Rogers. It very Rogers. much tied into Fred Rogers. At the, and we were getting ready to launch Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, which was a new kids series based on Fred Rogers' teachings. And so it all became this sort of beautiful conversation about what he was trying to instill in young people that every individual matters and that um, and really helping people have the confidence in in you know exploring the world in their own way and so forth it was really it was it was terrific and from that we jumped off to something called the idea channel which was really about taking lots of interesting ideas all juxtaposed and getting people interested about you know different topics all very quick cut paste and then with viewer comment again folded in and it really Really became the beginning of what has become a continual rollout of series. We have about 80 series up now, blank on blank, which are audio, audio recordings of these really great interviews, um, all then set to animation. And you really focus on on the conversation and what people are talking about. One of the very um, early ones uh, was really um, talking about. Um, you know, early jazz tours behind the Iron Curtain and how jazz was part of, you know, what really got people, you know, um, thinking about, um, you know, very different topics that were not related to music at all. I mean, it's just, it's great content and great material presented in a different way. None of these things, by the way, would work in television, but very much at the heart of what public television tries to do, or PBS has always tried to do, which is to really share interesting ideas and create conversation. You say one of the things that PBS needs to do in addition to helping uh, increase literacy and, and reading among children, for example, is develop emotional intelligence. 
intelligence, right. which is something uh, that, that uh, Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, did beautifully. Right. So explain how PBS is, is working uh, towards that end. So we, we have a wonderful um, uh, children's producer, Angela Santamara. She created Super Y, and she had always been a, she was always inspired by Fred Rogers. In fact, she had an opportunity to work with him for a while. And so she had this idea of what if we could reimagine what Fred Rogers produced. Now, obviously, he's passed away, and and you you want to be able to pay tribute to what he was doing, but also to sort of reimagine it for a contemporary audience. And so her idea was creating Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. She worked with Fred Rogers Production Company, and the whole spirit of Daniel Tiger, who, by the way, is a as a, as a um, animated character wears a little red sweater, and there are so many elements. So, so parents who remember Fred Rogers will see elements of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood in Daniel Tiger. But you know, helping children master some of the basic social emotional skills of you know um, of dealing with your emotions, dealing with disappointment, paying attention, all of those things. One very popular episode was helping a Daniel deal with. Um, the arrival of the new baby sister, Margaret, and what that meant when you were no longer the only child. And all of these are, um, you know, have been so popular because parents really do struggle to how they teach their children, um, you know, these skills. And these are the fundamental skills that if you talk to anyone involved in early childhood education, say, are so critically important and often are the difference between whether a child actually masters skill in school or whether they just languish behind because they can't pay attention in class. And so, um, and so that's what Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood is all about. You mentioned earlier uh, your two predecessors, uh, Pat Mitchell and, and Irvin Dugan, and he said something that I, I wanted to run past you because he left after five years, and he said it was because of the wear and tear. He said living in an intensely political atmosphere where PBS was treated often as a political football. And then he also talked about the constant temptation in the system to imitate the commercial TV industry, to run commercials, to do programming that is designed to attract big audiences rather than be true to our public service mission. And I'm wondering how great that struggle is today. Well, you know, I think there's always a tension um, in a media organization, and we talk about this a lot within our system, of the, really the tension as, you know, because we are mass media, so we do want to reach an audience, and particularly for children, I really do care how many children we reach, because the content that we're producing is not because I'm trying to sell, you know, you know soda pop to kids, uh, which, is a, which is someone else's business. What I am trying to do is to make sure that every child has has access to content that is really going to expand their mind and really help them, particularly as they get ready to enter school, you know, with these basic skills. And so, you know, you want, you need to develop programs that children will want to watch, but that also have the curriculum embedded in it. With the content for adults, it's the same thing. I really do want to find programming that is different and unique and is important. Um, and, but I also want to make sure that, you know, we're reaching more than five people, right? And so I, you know, we don't let ratings rule what we do. I mean, we would make very different decisions. You would see, you know, different types of programs on every night if that was the case. But what I do want to do is, is, is very much a balance. So there are programs in the schedule that I know when we put them on probably aren't going to get a really big audience, but for the audience that are coming, it's going to be a very important program. And so it's that constant balance that we have to pay attention to. So I think Irv's comments are really important, that it is always attention and it is always really paying attention to um, not going down that slippery slope of just picking programs just because you know they're going to be popular, but really that blend of programs that have wider audience appeal. It's the Downton Abbey, which I'm very proud of. It's the front lines, which I'm enormously proud of. It's that documentary film that is on an impactful subject that, you know, all of that is part and parcel of the whole fabric of what we're brought, bringing to the American public as part of PBS. What have you done? in the last nine years for which you are most proud and what most importantly do you want to do while you're uh, leading PBS? 
I would say the things that I'm the proudest of, I mean, obviously I'm really proud of, you know, any program that comes through that really has impact and makes a difference. I'm really proud of the fact that we're spending more time focusing on the arts, because I think that, you know, um, I think a, a society is really defined by the great art it creates, and I think helping people connect to that is important, particularly as I look at what's happened in arts education in schools. I'm really proud of the fact that our system as a whole really has, I think, come together in a way that um, that is very powerful. I mean, every station is individual, but I think for the most part, people do sort of agree amongst um, what are the important objectives. And I'm really proud that we've taken the risk in the digital space. Um, and I think I, you know, I look at industries that, you know, have 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 held back because something has worked for years. And I think the fact that we're able to take risk and agree that, you know, this is going to move us forward. I'm really proud of that. I I think this has been, these have been really challenging and such interesting years. And I think that, and when you look back over the history of public broadcasting, we're at a place very similar to the beginning days. What I'd love to do before I leave is really make sure that we remain the destination for smart and intelligent programming and that we serve as a, a centerpiece for the American public around dialogue and discourse. All right, Paula Kerger, thank you so much for talking with us. It's a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Paula Kerger. For additional footage from this interview, visit our website at conversations.psu.edu. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next Conversation from Penn State. If you've enjoyed Conversations from Penn State and would like to purchase a DVD of this show or any of our other episodes, order online at mediasales.psu.edu or call 1-800-770-2111.